Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Good morning. Yeah, sorry, you got me again. <laughs> Edward's on vacation. Yeah, so hey, if you were with us last week, Edward started a new series called What Would Jesus Do? Have you ever wondered? And uh, we're going to be addressing some issues this summer, some cultural issues, some things that are happening uh, in our culture, and, and how does that affect the church, and what do we think about that, and what does Scripture say about that really Okay, what, is, what does Scripture say? Uh, what, what, what are the things that we need to know as we navigate our culture? We live in a totally different culture than when the Bible was written, but it's obviously still relevant to us today, and there's things in there, and there's things that are not in there. And so we tend to kind of gravitate to where we feel comfortable as human beings. And so the question that, that we're going to be asking all summer, is, or one of the questions is, what would Jesus do? Another one of the questions that we're going to be uh, answering is, what would we do? And what are we supposed to do? And what do we as Bible-believing faithful followers of Jesus Christ, what do we do in this culture that we now live in? What do we do with the topics that seem to dominate a lot of the conversation, not just in America, but around the world and in the church? Is, re is it really enough, like Jesus said, to love God and love people and let everything else go? Is that really it? Or are there things that we need to be doing? Are there things that we need to not be doing? And what about this whole judgmental attitude that we all carry around. You know, it's interesting, last week Edward talked about alcohol. Alcohol doesn't, I, doesn't really, you know, I don't get in a rage and I don't judge people for alcohol. What we're going to talk about today, and I'll get that uh, here in a minute, I don't really, I don't have judgments against that. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and give you a spoiler. I'm in favor of what we're going to talk about today. But there are things that I get really, really judgmental about, things that aren't even in the scriptures. For example... If you're going to make a left-hand turn, please put your blinker on before you get to the red light so that I will know to go around you. Every morning when I drop my kids off at Hawkins and I go across the railroad tracks, you cannot make a left-hand turn at 7.30 in the morning in Hawkins, Texas from 14 to 80. There's too many kids dropping their, their kids off. And so if you don't have your blinker on, I assume you're going straight. Sorry. Have a beer. Have a glass of wine. Get a tattoo. I don't care. But for God's sakes, turn your blinker on. Now, you see what I'm saying with the judgmental attitude? Now, how Christ-like was that, what I just did? Not very, right? And so if you were here last week, Edward introduced us to four uh, religious sects that were in the days of Jesus and their attitudes toward culture. You had the Pharisees, the good boys that separated themselves from culture and basically did what I just did to everybody that wasn't a part of their group. 
You had the Sadducees who went the other way and said, we're going to immerse ourselves in culture and almost become acceptable and accept everything. Then you had the Zealots who were the religious, you know, they're the ones that, you know, Rome has to look exactly like the Jewish culture and we'll do everything in our power to make that happen. And then you had the Essenes and they were the ones just like, hey man, it's all groovy. We're just here to experience God, man. And that's what they did and they forgot about everything everything. And so for me, when I look at this series, and we've been talking about this for a while, when I look at this series, I really want to move myself from a place of, is it okay to do this or not? Is it okay to do this or not? Is it okay to do this or not? And I want to look at myself through the filter of those four groups, because I want to know what I do to other people in other cultures. And so I I wrestled with that this week, and I find myself, I'm not a zealot, I'm not an Essene, I do find myself fluctuating between the Pharisaical attitude and the Sadducee attitude. There are times where I'm just like, hey, you know what, it's all good, you know, immerse myself into culture, hang out with people that you probably think I don't need to be hanging out with, go into restaurants that you probably think I don't need to be going with, it's all good. And then I find myself a lot of times with the pharisaical attitude that like, if you don't think the way I think, then you're wrong. And so I find myself fluctuating between, and those are two pretty extreme stances. And I think somewhere in the middle is where God is honored. And so today we're going to be talking about tattoos. What about tattoos? What about people with those tattoos? And I've got to tell you up front, there's going to be a lot of information in this message, okay? I also have to tell you up front, I have a lot of energy, personal energy, when it comes to this message, because I have a couple of tattoos, okay? I have people in my family, and I quote, Jake either A, doesn't read his Bible, or B, he just doesn't understand what he's reading. <laughs> and you know what? It hurts. It really does. You know, tattoos have taken on a, a transformation over the last, I'd say, 40 or 50 years. When, when I was first exposed to tattoos, my uncle who's in his 80s now, was in the Navy. And I remember as a kid, he had the tattoo on his arm right there, man. And for me, it just, it just, it was what it was. I really didn't know it good, bad, or indifferent. You know, children are so innocent. We're all born with that 360 personality where everything's welcome, everything's. So I didn't know somebody had to tell me that that was a tattoo. And you were to never get one of those, and uncle got that before he knew Jesus, you know, those types of things. But now, you know, then tattoos were found on sailors, bikers, or at least that's where our judgment, all right? Bad people had tattoos. Well, now the art form has gone mainstream. Tattoos are found on soccer moms, CEOs, honor students, officers, businessmen, and women, teachers in our public school systems, and yes, even crazy pastors who hate people who don't turn on their blinkers. They're found everywhere. But there's still judgments, and there's still questions, and they're still wrestling with, is it acceptable? Does the Bible condemn them? Do we honor God with our bodies when we get tattoos? And what about those people, whoever those people are? And guys, I'm 45 years old. I've been a Christian for 17 years, and I have yet to figure out who those people are. So if you ever figure out who those people are, please tell me. Because for me, when I read my scriptures, it's just people. But yet... The popularity and the culture that we live in now that has been so accepting of tattoos, the trend doesn't necessarily mean that it's good, doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. We don't even know what it means. And so the question is, what would Jesus do? Would he get a tattoo? I don't know. How would he treat people with tattoos? What would he say about it? And so we're going to dive in a little bit because I'm not sure we can answer that, but I do know that we can dive into some scriptures and then uh, I'm going to kind of share with you some things and some of it. And, and let me just tell you this. Again, I have a lot of energy here because it's personal for me, all right? But I want to be biblical. I want to be faithful. 
I don't want to be sarcastic, which is hard for me to do, all right? But again, I want us to understand what we're talking about when we talk about this subject. So, Leviticus 19. Doesn't Leviticus 19 condemn tattoos? Well, let's look at Leviticus 19, verse 28, I believe it is, if you'll throw it up. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. So, this prohibition falls in, in the book of Leviticus, along with several others given to Israel, and, and we'll get to that in a minute. In fact, there were 76 prohibitions in the book of Leviticus given to the Israelites, this being only one, and probably the most famous, okay? It falls in with a lot of other things God was telling Israel to stay away from. And, and what you need to understand that was happening when this was written and these commands were being given is the Israelites were being delivered from Egypt and they were on their way to Canaan. So they were leaving the Egyptians and then they were about to go into a land that was filled with Canaanites. All right? That's the first thing you need to understand. Second thing you need to understand is the literal translation of Leviticus 19.28 actually says this, And a cutting for the dead you will not make in your flesh, and writing marks you will not make on you. I am the Lord. Now, writing refers to like inscribed or engraved. The words or the writing marks has no root to it. So we really don't know what that means. It has an uncertain root. Furthermore, the word tattoo that we use today in our English language did not even appear in our English language until the late 1700s. Now, do you know what happened about 100 years before that? The Bible was translated into King James. They didn't have a word for this marking for the dead, this cutting yourself, these marks that they were doing. So King James translated it writing marks, and then as our English language developed over the years, we put tattoos. Ye shall not print marks upon you. You shall not engrave or cut yourselves for the dead. Why? Well, the background lies in Egypt and Canaan. Remember, they're coming out of one place and they're going into another place. History says that the Egyptians marked their women and cut their women and branded their women on their bellies and on their breasts when they were pregnant as an act of worship to their God that the women would have healthy pregnancies. Isn't that crazy? And it wasn't a tattoo. It wasn't done with ink. It was more of like when you brand cattle and you take a hot and you... That's basically what we're talking about. The Canaanites would do the very same thing on their bodies in honor of their dead as a worship sacrifice to their pagan god. They would brand themselves with their dead because they thought that by doing that, they're honoring their God and their God would accept their dead. And so like branding or, or slashing or cutting, they would typically, it, whatever this looked like, they would imply that if you make these cuts on yourself for the dead, then your God would receive them. Now, obviously, in light of that, it would make sense for God to tell the Israelites, do not do this, okay? I am the Lord. I give life, all right? I open the womb. I decide if a baby is born healthy or not. Not some burning of your skin to a pagan God, all right? You honor your dead through mourning rituals, and the Israelites had their rituals for mourning the dead. We have our rituals for mourning the dead. But to, to, to brand yourself as a sacrifice to a pagan god is not the way the Hebrews, the Israelites, or us Christians today are to honor our dead. It was idol worship. 
It was a sign of identifying either with the Egyptian false gods or with the Canaanite false gods in a, in a form of idol worship. And so God in Leviticus bans that practice. Now, there's 75 other things that he bans as well. So does that mean that tattoos as we know it are banned? Is it unlawful? Is it unbiblical? Is it, um, is it still identified with idol worship? All right? Before we answer that question, I want to just, and this is, y'all, man, y'all pray for me. I don't want to be a smart aleck, but seriously, Leviticus bans a lot of stuff. Eating fat, failing to testify against any wrongdoing you've witnessed. First thing that came to my mind was pleading the fifth. In our government system, we have the right as citizens of the United States to plead the fifth. Okay? Could not do that as an Israelite in the time of Leviticus. Touching an unclean animal. Letting your hair become unkept. And this really didn't have anything to do with cutting. It was just letting it be unkept, period. No bedhead. No bedhead in Leviticus. Eating an animal which doesn't both chew cud and has a divided hoof. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> this might be my favorite. Eating or touching the carcass of any seafood without fins or scales. No crawfish bowls, no fried shrimp. We had crawfish dip at our small group gathering last night. It was wonderful. And then I was looking over my notes this morning and had to ask God for forgiveness. Just kidding. <laughs> there it was. You're supposed to be praying for me, not to be sarcastic. <laughs> going to church or going to worship or offering a worship to God within 33 days after giving birth to a boy. Doing the same thing within 66 days after giving birth to a girl. Banned in Leviticus. Reaping to the very edges of your property. This is where Holly Lake Ranch got that 10-foot rule. I guarantee you. You could not reap. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You live in Holly Nothing, ten, no permanent structure 10 feet from your property line. That's got God all over it. Could not do that in Leviticus. Picking up grapes that have fallen in your vineyard. Banned in Leviticus. Mixing fabrics and clothing, 50-50 blends, banned in Leviticus. No crossbreeding animals, no labradoodles, no pit mixes. <laughs> Eating fruit from a tree within four years of planting it, wouldn't those things be rotten after four years? <laughs> trimming your beard, I actually like this one and I vote that we keep it. No <laughs> trimming your beard. Cutting your hair at the sides, Th this actually cursing your father and mother, and this cursing your father and mother, which is validated not only uh, in the Ten Commandments that Moses received, but also validated in the New Testament. This is one of those ones that, for our benefit, cursing your father and mother, because honoring our father and mother um, says that we have a promise that comes with that. The interesting thing about this is we do this all the time. If you've ever raised children, if you've ever been a child, you have cursed your father and mother. It's not talking about cursing literally like we know cursing. It's just talking about disrespect, being unrespectful to your parents. Working on the Sabbath. Oh, that's easy. You're not supposed to work on Sunday. That's not the Sabbath. So not only have we messed this one up, we've gone and changed the entire day. Sabbath is Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. All right. So we break that one every day. So obviously, here's my point. If tattooing as we know it, which that's not what Leviticus was talking about, but if tattooing as we know it in today's culture is still banned today, then why aren't these? What makes these so acceptable today? Why is it we can walk into a restaurant and get a big old fat ribeye and eat fat and all with a clear conscience. Leviticus obviously says you can't do that. Why can we do the things that we do, have crawfish bowls with a clear conscience when Leviticus always says you can't do that? 
Why can we change the entire day of the Sabbath without consulting God and then say, you can't do anything on Sunday when it was supposed to be Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, and we all work on Sunday anyway? Why can we do that with a clear conscience? And yet this one word, this one thing in our church culture today gets a lot of people fired up tattoos. Why? So what would Jesus do? Well, before we get to that, there's an interesting passage in Isaiah 49. In Isaiah 49, 16, the prophet Isaiah, who is speaking for God, says, Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. In Isaiah 49, God is assuring his people that he will not forget them. Indeed, he cannot forget them. And he decides to use an illustration that would surprise many of us. You know, Israel was in a great time of trouble during the days of Isaiah. God was judging them for their rebellion and sin. They had been exiled. The Babylonians had come in, destroyed their country. They had carried many of the Hebrews away, and the people were crying out. And if you read in Isaiah, the people were crying out, where is God in all this? He has forgotten us. And what was God's answer? I've not forgotten you. How could I? I even have a tattoo of you on the palm of my hands. Now, we know that God does not have a tattoo on the palm of his hands. He doesn't even have arms in this sense. But what an interesting illustration that he uses. You know, that word that he uses, engraved, literally means to be inscribed upon. It doesn't mean to be carved like you would carve out or engrave an image. The Hebrew word is actually kalkak, which means to write or to print, very different, a writing or a print like this is versus what God was condemning the Egyptians and the Canaanites were doing, which was scarification, where they were branding into their people as idol worship. God uses this illustration and says, I have graven or I have written. It's the same word that they use in Jeremiah 17.1 and Exodus 32.16, where it says, I will write my commands on your hearts, he tells us that, is his people. And so God figuratively says to his people who thought that God had forgotten them, no, 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 it's impossible. I have written you on the palms of my hands. And I find it interesting that when our English language began to really take shape in the 1700s, that we could take a word like tattoo and substitute it in Leviticus, but here we don't when in actuality It's basically the same thing. God says, I've made a mark with indelible ink, a mark that you cannot remove, a mark that will be there forever. I've written it in the palms of my hands. You see, the point is clear enough that how can God condemn something when he uses the illustration? See, I don't believe God is condemning tattoos. He is just like with every other law in Leviticus and just about every other law that was made, he is condemning association with pagan theology and worship. He did not want his people at that time to be integrated with the Canaanites. I mean, he, he even gave specific instructions. Don't let your women marry their men. Don't let your men marry their women and vice versa. And so now we usher in a new, and Jesus comes in the flesh with arms, okay, with legs, no tattoos that we know of, and ushers in a new covenant where he fulfills the law, where he goes to the cross, takes the penalty for our sin, and then ushers in a new covenant. Paul says, you know, that the law was there to expose the sin, but now we are not under the law. We are under the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the New Testament does have a lot to say about a lot of stuff that God ushered in in the Old Testament. For instance, we're still not to create idols. We're still not to worship idols. We're still to honor our father and mother. We are still to stay away from witchcraft and divination and all that other stuff. Uh, There's a lot still to stay, do not murder. I mean, there's a lot of things that the New Testament addresses that Jesus addressed. And by the way, that Jesus even took a few steps further 
I mean, not only are you not supposed to murder, you're not even supposed to have hateful thoughts towards your brother because if you do that, you've already committed the sin of murder. Same with adultery. It just takes the second look. And we as men or women have already committed adultery against our spouse. So the New Testament and Jesus didn't come in and do away with everything. But guys, let's be honest. There are things, even in Jesus' day, totally different than when Leviticus was written. It's totally different now. Remember, the Bible is God-inspired, and it is still applicable today if we read it right. So what does the New Testament say about tattoos? Nothing. Nothing. Never mentions it. Never refers back to the scarification for the worship of the dead. Never refers back to branding your women so that your babies would be healthy. Never refers back to anything that has to do with putting a mark on your arm or on your thigh or on your leg. Doesn't mention it at all. Now, we, as good Bible Belt Christians, we mention a lot of scriptures that we think talk about tattooing. We mentioned 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, where it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. One of the most common passages of Scripture brought up to argue against tattooing, the argument is that our bodies are not our own, that they belong to God. And so because our bodies belong to God, we shouldn't mark them up. Here's the problem. It never says that, and that scripture is actually talking about sexual immorality. Paul is addressing sexual immorality in the church. If you know anything about the Corinthian church, Edward always says that we're a bunch of jacked up people. That church was jacked up. And Paul was addressing their rampant sexual immorality. He was talking about how they need to flee from sexual immorality. Paul even goes on to do something that we really think is taboo in the church today. But Paul did it. Paul begins to separate sin. He says every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual immorality is against your own body. Do not do it. And then he uses this passage. Do not commit sexual immorality because your body was bought with a price. That body doesn't belong to you. Then he goes on to say, and Jesus confirms this, that actually when we get married, our bodies belong to our spouses. And so he takes it even further. But it's still in the context of sex. Flee from sexual immorality because your body belongs to God. And then when he gets into marriage, he says, hey, do not deny sex with your partner because your body belongs to her and her body belongs to him. It's not talking about tattoos. But if you want me to, I can play the game of, well, maybe this is talking about tattoos because, of course, if you get an ugly tattoo, like if you get some really bad shoddy work, then you've just de-glorified your body for God. Okay, let's go down that road for just a second because we must be really, really careful when we use scriptures that talk about something else to fit our own personal preference. See, this question of what can you do to your body and what can't you do to the body must be carefully answered using Scripture, which is our authority in all faith and all practice. Not just whether or not you should get a tattoo. Not just whether or not you should smoke a cigarette or a cigar. Not just whether or not you should have a, a glass of bourbon or a nice cold IPA. But in everything... Very few people know what I'm about to share. I have a sin issue. And this, I'm not being sarcastic. I, I'm, I'm going to be serious. Just, I have a sin issue. I am a Bible-believing Christ follower who loves Jesus, who knows he's been redeemed, who knows he's been forgiven, who knows the spirit of God lives in me, who knows the spirit of God that lives in me is the same spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead. I get all that and I still have a sin issue that has plagued me and plagued me and plagued me. And when I tell you, you're gonna do what every other person does that I've ever told, you're gonna laugh. 
But the Bible talks more about my sin than he ever does tattoos or alcohol or smoking. And that's the sin of gluttony. I'm an overeater. I have high cholesterol. I have high blood sugar. I have high blood pressure. My doctor and my wife have been on me for years. If you don't get this under control, if you don't get this under control, if you don't get this under control, you will die. It is the socially accepted sin in the church. While me having a nice cold IPA may cause you to stumble, your double cheeseburger at the buffet on your third plate, you have no idea what that does to me. Just because it's not your sin, just because it doesn't tickle your fancy, just because you can you know, say, well, that's wrong and nitpick and cherry pick doesn't mean it's scriptural or biblical. To me, I would love to have a body full of these and to be laying in a hospital bed one day with my family around me and my doctor say, you just never could get your eating under control, could you? You just never could. And so what I'm saying is this, we have things that are acceptable. We can even go back to Leviticus and we can laugh at, he really condemned shellfish? Well, that's stupid. He really condemned going to church after having a baby? That's stupid. You really can't reap to the edge of your field? That's stupid. You really can't pick up grapes? That's stupid. You really can't eat fruit from a tree within four years? That's stupid. You really can't trim your beer? That's stupid. You can't scarify your body? You can't cut it? Huh? No, let's call that tattoos. And then let's judge every body that we see whose arms and legs look different than ours. All the while, all the while, we will pick something that is sociably acceptable that God actually condemns in the New Testament. I'm telling you, it blows my mind. And so what would Jesus do? Well, before we answer that, let's, let's talk about what we should do. Look, here's the bottom line. What should you do? Well, when it comes to you personally in tattoos, all right, you do what you feel like you want to do. If you can get a tattoo with a clear conscience and in faith and honor the Lord with it, go for it. If you can't, don't. If your spouse is okay with you getting a tattoo and you can do it in a clear conscience and in art, go for it. If she's not, I wouldn't do it. If your tattoo is going to create an unnecessary barrier between your vocation, if your job bans it and you want to keep your job, then hey, dude, don't get a tattoo. But if your job is okay with it, you can do it with a clear conscience, man, go for it. I don't care. And I don't think God does either. I really don't. Matthew chapter 22, Jesus reaffirms again something that was in the Old Testament. Guy asked him, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, hey, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. So what do you do with those people that have tattoos? You love them. Man, God, you love them. But what if they're pre-Jesus tattoos? What if they're gang tattoos? Yeah! Those are the coolest ones I've seen. I'm just telling you. <laughs> they're awesome. You love them. What if, they still, what if they still don't know Jesus and they're still getting tattoos that don't glorify God? Okay, what if your neighbor is still an alcoholic? What, what if your sister or somebody in your family is still caught up in the prostitution ring? What if your brother or your best friend is still addicted to pornography? What, what, what are we talking about here? 
Limits of grace, our grace can go this far but not that far. Our love can go this far and not that far. That's not the Jesus I serve. It's certainly not the one that I read about. If they're still in a gang, if they're still worshiping idols, and they're still marking their body to glorify that, love them anyway. They need to know God. They may think your tattoos are awesome and it may stir up a conversation. I don't know. But you love them. We live in a culture. We live in a culture, and I'm talking about church culture now. I'm not talking about the culture of the United States or the culture of the world. I'm talking about the church culture now. We live in a culture, in a church culture, where we have made our own decisions. A lot of this was shaped by how we were raised but we've made our own decisions of what is going to be acceptable and what is not going to be acceptable. All right, so we've predetermined that alcohol is unacceptable in the church when Scripture clearly says otherwise. We've, We've made our judgments and we've made our determinations that tattoos are unacceptable in the church when I believe Scripture is made clear. No. And then we've accepted the things that are comfortable to us. And then we judge those that don't fit in our box. We always say, hey, don't put God in the box. God is bigger than the box. I think, I mean, yeah, that's true. Obviously, don't put God in the box. But, dude, some of us need to break out of our own boxes. We've been in a box. We've been in this, this box of what we think is right and what we think is wrong and for so long that we've forgotten how other people were raised. We've forgotten how uh, this is not the only culture that's there are people that if they were to walk there are christians in other countries that if they were to walk into this church culture would be like what in the world are you people doing it's just different now there's some things that are unacceptable we get it i'm not saying that everything's acceptable but what i am saying is everybody is it's a big difference you may hate tattoos that's fine. They may trigger something in you, and that's, that's fine, but don't hate me or anybody else that has one. I envy, look, my eating goes in cycles. I'm on a good cycle. I'm 21 pounds uh, lighter than I was on April the 7th. Yeah. But hang on. <laughs> Here comes negative Nelly. <laughs> I could stand up here in six months and be right back up. It's, it's, it's an addiction, okay? I'm in a good season right now. My point is this. Why, why is my sin so acceptable to you? Why is that? And why do we judge other people in ways that God would never do this side of heaven? So Summit, here's, here's, here's how I want to wrap up today. Love God and love people. What would Jesus do personally? I don't know. Corporately, he would love people. And he would minister to them exactly where they are. And so the next time <laughs> your waiter comes and puts your food down and their arm is just covered, Instead of going to your reaction first, look that person in the eye and know they were created in the same image of the same God that you were created in. Amen? Let's pray. So we're going to come back for a time of worship. We're going to end our service. We end, this is the way we end all of our services. Uh, we want to invite you to respond to the message. We've got some elders and some prayer team members uh, that will either be up front or they'll be in the back where Grace Place is. And we just want to give you an opportunity to respond. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you need, maybe you're like me and something today, you, you didn't hear anything past the red light illustration. And you know you've got a judgmental heart and you just want somebody to pray over you for that. I will invite you to come. Maybe you need to spend time at the altar praying with your family. Maybe you need to give your life to Christ. You know, the gospel is what evens everything. Tattoos, alcohol, drugs, prostitution, everything is level at the cross of Christ. Everything. 
Maybe you've never met this God of the universe that we worship called Jesus, and you need to grab an elder or a prayer team member by the hand. They'll be up front, and they would love to be able to talk and pray with you. For the others of you, you just want to worship. So we invite you, after I pray, to go and take communion. We have tables set up in the front and the back and spend some time in worship and then come back when you're done with communion and we'll worship through one last song and then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Father God, you're good and I love you. I do. I thank you so much for Jesus. I'm, as I was preaching, I want to confess, I'm looking at the faces of these people and I'm just so thankful for the people you brought in our church. Thankful for the ministries that we have here. Father, as we wrestle in our hearts this summer, and God, these first two topics were easy compared to what we're going to get into in the later weeks. But as we wrestle through these topics this summer, God, would you do something in our hearts? Would you show us, Father, where we are judgmental and maybe our heart needs to be softened. Father, I pray over our people as we dismiss for communion, as we open up in a time of worship, God, that if somebody needs to respond, move them through the power of your Holy Spirit. And God, just inhabit our praise for the next few moments. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.